Yes. Presumably the mic hears me too. <laughs> okay. So, I'm here to talk to you about MariaDB. And you're probably wondering why database like MariaDB makes it on the schedule. And I think one of the biggest changes for CentOS 7 is the fact that you don't get MySQL as a default anymore. You get MariaDB. How many here here use MySQL? OK. How many here use MariaDB, maybe? <laughs> oh, even better. This is good news. I actually work on MariaDB, so that's my day job. Oh, I'm going to speak from French now, maybe. Bonjour. <laughs> I've been working in the MySQL uh, ecosystem for more than 10 years. I worked on MariaDB, MySQL at like four different companies. And before that, I was involved in the Fedora project as well. How many here are developers? OK. Operators? OK. Bit of both? OK. So RHEL 6.5 had something called software collections. I believe um, Karan Bear's team also built, <laughs> rebuilt that for CentOS. And that was the first example of you getting uh, MariaDB. You got MariaDB 5.5.35, basically replacing the um, stock 5.1.73, um, I think, that was shipped. MySQL 5.1 was released in 2008. A lot has changed, a lot has improved. So that was um, in the 6.5 area. And then with CentOS 7, there is no longer a community MySQL package either. You just get MariaDB 5.5.33a, and this gets upgraded as time goes by. Anybody here using OpenShift from Red Hat? OK. So um, OpenShift also has a MariaDB cartridge, if that happens. And I guess for the first time, previously, if you had installed CentOS, the recommended upgrade path was for you to actually just make a new install. But for CentOS 7, you could actually upgrade from CentOS 6. The uh, upgrade path is supported as a mechanism. OK, I realize that's a little small, but you actually do now don't see uh, the MySQL database server, but you actually see the MariaDB database server. And um, ever since uh, CentOS 7 got released, you probably know a couple weeks later, the nice folk at Oracle rebuild CentOS packages. So now you can actually buy support for MariaDB from Oracle. <laughs> so for the um, people that are wondering if MariaDB or MySQL are still used, 19 of the top 20 websites run some variant of MySQL Plus, plus. Nobody runs a stock MySQL. To be fair, the people like Google, YouTube, and Wikipedia, well, Google and YouTube don't run a stock MariaDB. Yes, they migrated to MariaDB. They run a MariaDB with all of their own patches. Wikipedia runs a stock MariaDB. Facebook runs a MySQL 5.6 with about 350 patches, which they publish. So nobody runs um, anything stock out there. Taobao um, from China sent um, features like multi-source replication into MariaDB. So um, yeah, you get a lot of people running um, MySQL variants in the top 20 websites. For obvious reasons, number 10 does not run MySQL or MariaDB. They run SQL Server because they're owned by Microsoft. MariaDB is a complete drop-in replacement to MySQL. The MariaDB 5.5 that ships inside of CentOS 7 is fully compatible with MySQL 5.5 and has a lot of features that only come out in MySQL 5.6 and some that only come out in MySQL 5.7, which is not released yet. It is really developed by a community. While I'm lucky to get paid by SkySQL to work on this on a daily basis, we only constitute about 40% of the committers to the MariaDB project. So the rest of 60% are actually external contributors who don't work at SkySQL. So this is a very unlike MySQL where 100% of the contributors work for Oracle. 
We are backed by a foundation, kind of like uh, the Linux Foundation and so forth. We aim to be fully feature enhanced, and that's you know pretty much what I'm here to talk to you about. Some of the features you get in 5.5, and then what you can look forward to in 10.0, which is already out. We're fully backwards compatible, so that means there's a drop-in replacement. In CentOS, obviously, you realize all the connectors are rebuilt against MariaDB, but if you happen to be using another distribution, your connectors will just work with MariaDB. They don't have any changes. Your applications will just work. There's no migration. The upgrade process is as easy as shutting it down, uh, shutting down your current server, installing MariaDB, starting it up, and it'll just run MySQL upgrade for you. And because we were not the originators of possibly quite a lot of the code, we are GPL v2 licensed. We have about half a million lines of extra code that we generated, but we're only GPL v2 licensed. So there's no um, enterprise product like you get with MySQL today. We have only been around since 2010 in terms of releases. And uh, someone earlier asked me about why, why we started. And the, lar the largest reason we started is because it turns out that Oracle wanted to buy Sun. And we'd spent all our lives building MySQL to compete against Oracle eventually. I know that may sound like a funny thing back in the day, but everybody has a long roadmap. Today, people may laugh at, say, MongoDB trying to compete with Oracle, but I'm sure they have a long roadmap too. Um, so that's why we started it in 2009. When the announcement was made, we went out and started it, and we only made a, our first release in 2010. But since then, we've released close to like seven or eight GA products. And in that same time, Oracle has released two GA products. They have a much larger team than we do, but we seem to move in a much more agile fashion. We try to initially aim to release every six months, like fast-paced Linux distributions targeting Fedora. Then we realized six months, and then we had to, if we have to support it for five years, would be too much work for us, so we now push to nine months. And the reality of that is, if we really say we want a nine month release cycle, we get one release every year nowadays. And then at that release is supported for five years. MariaDB 5.5 is supported for eight years, as long as RHEL is supported. We then also experimented a lot by including things like a Galera cluster. Anybody here use OpenStack or play with some of these cloud stack? Stuff. Okay, so presumably you've heard the ter heard of Galera cluster, and we also ship a version like uh, like Percona XDB cluster. The other things we ended up doing were open sourcing things that MySQL was selling you in the enterprise version. They sell you a PAM authentication plugin. And we thought we might as well open source one for you. It took us actually two weeks to write, so no no reason to pay some five thousand dollars per server. A thread pool, if you have many short running queries like typical web apps, we included that inside. And that's actually one of the popular reasons why people like to switch to MariaDB is because they actually have access to a thread pool and it's completely open source. Audit plugin, enterprises love auditing what happens. Actually, they don't love it. They're forced to do it. In the US, they have the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. I'm sure there's something equivalent here in France to make sure that every access to, say, a bank account is logged and we give you the audit plugin. We provide YUM and APT repositories as well, which uh, in, I guess inspired Oracle to eventually start providing that now. So two things inspired MySQL upstream to give you YUM and APT repositories. One, we were doing it. Two, all the distributions started switching away or not shipping MySQL any longer, so they, had a way, they need to get away for you to use it. So. I think that's better for the community now that everybody has you know, additional choice. We are the default in Fedora, OpenSUSE, Slash, and a whole bunch of other distributions like Arch Linux and so forth. If you use Docker, there, there are plenty of uh, scripts online that uh, help you use MariaDB easily. Puppet, Puppet and Chef, all have plenty for MariaDB. So we're well supported overall. If you used MySQL for a long time, you'd realize this is how it's generally architected. 
typically you have your, your app sitting on the top, you have some kind of connector, whatever language you want. It then goes to a connection pool and so forth. We choose to expand MariaDB in two ways. One via replication. So we believe in extending the replication, the binary log, giving you better replication features overall. Previous releases of MariaDB focused a lot on the optimizer. Our optimizer in 5.5 is much better than the MySQL 5.5 optimizer, and in many cases, it beats the MySQL 5.6 optimizer. And optimizers are complex things, but generally speaking, the major benefit for you is that your queries come back faster. So that's a good thing. So we choose to expand on replication, and the other one we choose to expand on is pluggable storage engines. Typically, you use InnoDB as a default, or ExtraDB that we ship. But generally, you may want to connect to a Cassandra cluster. I notice there's training materials at the back, or at least a training brochure that talks about Cassandra. And we can actually give you SQL access to a Cassandra cluster from MariaDB. We can give you access to RocksDB, which is why I put LevelDB on that side. LevelDB, RocksDB is a fork of LevelDB from Facebook. LevelDB is actually a very commonly used embedded engine that's been extended. Anybody here use the Chrome web browser? Yeah, maybe. You, if you use Chrome, you're using LevelDB. It's already embedded. So RocksDB is Facebook's fork of it, and we work actively with Facebook to make sure that you actually have access to RocksDB as well. And we provide many other storage engines, some of which also can work with MySQL, but are not shipped with MySQL. So the bonus is that we will actually ship it and you can use it. So the first half of the talk is tailored towards the developers. Then the second half goes for the uh, operators. But since there are more operators than developers here, I will probably go through the developer stuff much quicker. For one, in the MariaDB 5.5 that you get inside of CentOS, you get something called microsecond support. That means you get accuracy up to six decimal points. MySQL 5.6 included this as something known as fractional seconds in time values. Why is this useful? Because typically a lot of queries come back in one second now because your CPUs are really fast. Maybe you want to have finer grain logging. We can do that for you. As another bonus, we don't convert temporal values to strings when you compare them because you can compare two temporal values. We, we compare them as temporal values so you actually get much faster speed because you're saving on conversions. Of course, if you don't turn this on, it doesn't affect you. But if you do turn it on, then it will change the on-disk data format. And we also preserve microseconds in arguments. So like I said, MySQL 5.6 does include this which is on the right-hand side, and it drops the microseconds when you actually do a select, so it only stores it internally, whereas we actually give it to you as well. Another developer feature that should be quite handy that is not even in 5.6 is something called virtual columns that you get access to inside of MariaDB 5.5. If you come from a SQL server or an Oracle server background, you already have this, you, you're used to it. It's basically storing business logic in your application. So the values can either be automatically calculated or pre-calculated. Typical use cases for this, besides um, business logic, a good example would be uh, e-store that needs to sell in multiple currencies. So if you have your base currency as the euro, and every three hours or so the euro changes to the US dollar, you just need to input the data in from the currency exchange and the US dollar price changes every three hours. So the base price is zeros. So the virtual columns computes on the fly, so it's very much like a view. But the persistent columns are kind of handy because it is like a materialized view because you can actually use it in secondary indexes. Both MySQL and MariaDB do not support materialized views like Postgres does. But if you want a little workaround, you can use it via virtual columns. 
This feature obviously only works inside of MariaDB. So if you're migrating your application, it'll, it won't be there. But if you start making use of it, good on you. Now, to whet your appetite as to why you may want to switch to MariaDB 10, and eventually I'm sure uh, you will be able to get that easily inside of CentOS 7 as well without adding our repositories, is that we give you PCRE regular expressions. PCRE being Perl compatible regular expressions. If you use PHP or Perl, you're probably very familiar with this now. We've extended our regeps and our like operator to give you that. We give you a few additional functions to replace within strings, find positions in strings, and then also find substrings. This is great when you're ingesting lots of data. Typically, if you're importing, importing streams of HTTP, web logging traffic, etc., this should be good for you. It's fast because it's based on PCRE. Supports everything PCRE does, including things like recursive patterns, multi-line matching, etc. Naturally, these things do not exist inside of MySQL. Um, I think that one interesting thing about this is it took one student three months to write, a Google Summer of Code student, three months to write with mentoring for us, and we actually included it in shortly thereafter. So it's not actually hard to get started hacking on MariaDB or MySQL, even though the code base now is nearly 20 years old. Next year is, uh, is the 20th anniversary of MySQL, next May. Presumably, you don't use um, uh, East Asian character sets here much, but we really do um, focus on that. Previous versions of MariaDB and MySQL only support 8-bit character sets, but now we actually support the uh, full multi-byte character sets inside of MariaDB 10. So we think this is actually important going forward. Anybody here do anything with mapping? Nope. <laughs> okay. If you're ever going to do anything with mapping, typically you choose PostGIS, very good choice. Or lately, people also have MongoDB as another choice. We'd like to let you know that the MariaDB shipping inside of CentOS 7 also has full GIS support, which is something that MySQL previously did not have. MySQL allowed you to store basically what is a latitude and longitude to, to show you uh, a rectangle or a square, but we can actually allow you to calculate paths between that. We followed the OpenGIS requirements of the Open Geospatial Consortium, the OGC. So all um, geospatial um, types have the ST prefix to them. So migrating your application, say, from PostGIS to MariaDB should be relatively easy now. The only thing that you probably need to realize, which I've put in bold, is that the engine equals MyIsam. Currently, spatial indexes only work with MyIsam or ARIA. InnoDB and ExtraDB don't have spatial index support because they don't support R3 indexes. They only have B plus tree with the adaptive hash index. We inspired innovation here again because Oracle realized that this is quite a useful feature. So in 5.7, it's likely that they will include this. And they're going to include spatial index types inside of InnoDB as well. So we didn't decide to stop just there, obviously. Giving you a feature alone is probably not of much use. So we actually started working with the OpenStreetMap team. So if you happen to use Apple Maps, presumably you realize that there is OpenStreetMaps data in there as well. And OpenStreetMaps, we found out, used to use PostGIS um, as a main store because that's where you could store GIS functions. And then they used to do analytics in MySQL. Going forward, we'd very much like that you could actually just switch over. So the first couple of slides allow you to see how OpenStreetMap data can be imported into MariaDB. And if you ever wanted to use the OpenStreetMap data set inside of MariaDB, we provide su such instructions as well. So we don't, we're not going to rest on our laurels. For 10.1, which we will beta in October, the alpha release is already out. We support the third coordinate. The third coordinate in GIS is typically altitude. We will have a spatial aware optimizer. So 
your spatial queries should run better. And we will, ex we will expose all GIS functions in system tables so you can query them via the information schema. Now, something that's cool that exists only in MariaDB and not MySQL is dynamic columns. One of the major um, booms to the NoSQL ecosystem, which kind of started in 2009, was the fact that you didn't have to have a schema. People didn't like schemas. Alter altering tables inside of MySQL could take you even months, actually, depending on your data set. So here we decided to allow you to create virtual columns for each and every row and store dynamic content inside. You could also define and redefine the numbers of columns available, as well as data types on a row by row basis without ever altering the table configurator. How do we do this? We basically allow you to create one massive blob. And then in, the, in that blob, we gave you handling functions like create, get, add, etc. So each dynamic column can be up to one gigabyte in size in that blob because that is the typical max allowed packet. And uh, we think this is kind of cool for two reasons. One, it gives you the opportunity to have access to collect your data back as JSON. So the output won't be just SQL. The output, we can spit out JSON output. It's our first foray into playing with JSON because in 10.1, we'd like you to also push JSON queries if possible. That is the current uh, aim. So we'll let, let's see if we can make it. Another thing that it allowed us to do is to interface with other, other storage engines that support dynamic column families like Cassandra. This is potentially useful assuming you have Cassandra users, and there are um, quite a number, Netflix, Uyala, I'm not sure how popular Cassandra is here. So dynamic columns gives us this opportunity to expand into two different areas. Now, because dynamic columns does not exist in MySQL, our Cassandra storage engine will never work there. But many other storage engines I talk about possibly can. Do you do full text search in your database? Or if you send that all to something like Elasticsearch or Lucene? If you are still doing full text search in your database, Sphinx is actually a very popular full text search library. Packages are available in all popular distributions. One reason why I like Sphinx is because it's small. You, have, you just have two binaries that are running at any given time, the index daemon and the search daemon. And now we give you full access via SQL to your Sphinx servers over the network. And this happens um, to be used in production even at a place like Craigslist. I don't know if Craigslist is popular here. Maybe. But you may have heard of it, obviously. So Sphinx SE is just an engine that depends on the daemon that actually has to run. It doesn't store any data itself. It's a remote storage engine like the federated engine that used to ship. It's just a built-in built -in client for MariaDB to talk to Sphinx's search D, run queries, obtain results. Typical use cases is if you're running MyISAM for full text search and everything else is InnoDB, you could port this easily. InnoDB 5.6 includes full text search now, but the speeds in comparison to MyISAM's full text search is nowhere, is nowhere there yet. InnoDB's full text search is still slow. And Sphinx is, is good because it you know, does sorting, filtering, slicing of results. That's what it's made to do. So you don't have to use things like a where clause, order by, or limit. Let Sphinx do it because that's what it's optimized to do. Naturally, you have to configure Sphinx. I'm not going to talk about that. You can run it on a local host, or you can run it on a, or over a network and a remote host. And all our engines support something called condition pushdown. So when you do have a clause, say after the where, that all those conditions are pushed to the storage engine so it doesn't run in the, in the MariaDB optimizer, it runs on the remote server. <coughs> this actually gives you better performance. We don't obviously need to talk too much about this, except that when you have 
to speak to other engines. So like Sphinx is an example, Federated is an example, Cassandra is an example. You need to set it up in such a way that the other engine gets data in a form that it likes. In this case, you get things like ID, weight, and queries. And if you notice at the bottom, which is kind of small, probably from the back, the select query looks very much like how you'd make a regular SQL query. So if you want to ever search Sphinx tables, you must always add, have three basic columns. And that's basically it. And, this is, and the only reason I put this here is so that you get into the idea that you probably do the same thing for things like Cassandra and so forth. Now, anybody here use Cassandra? Okay. What version of Cassandra do you use? Before 1.2? Uh, no, no, no. Not the last one, but... Um, 2.0. Yeah. Okay. So, Cassandra... Yeah, the upgrade is not easy. <laughs> exactly. So this is the thing we find with the Cassandra is one thing, upgrades are not easy. Debugging is not easy because you have to actually start looking at Java, the garbage collector there, etc. And profiling on Java is not necessarily the easiest thing either. Cassandra then also did something else funky. After 1.2, they broke the Thrift API. Thrift, Thrift basically allows you to recompile Java as C or C, C++. It was released by Facebook. What, why they broke the Thrift API? Because they wanted to create uh, their own um, C, C client. Now, what they did was they released their client as Apache license. Apache licenses don't mix with GPL, which we are. So we, can, we have the technology to give you access to Cassandra 2.0. Unfortunately, licensing prevents us from doing that legally. So the version we ship supports right up until Cassandra 1.2. Again, nothing we can do from a technical standpoint. We just need data stacks to relicense their connector. We didn't support super columns even in our 1.2 release, mainly because Cassandra deprecated it already. There's obviously no one-to-one -one direct map for data types, but we do support the full SQL. So selects, insert, update, deletes. All your CRUD operations are supported. You uh, need to, of course, um, turn on something called a join cache level. So you need to use hash, ca hash joins. And like, very much like um, Sphinx, you again need to set it up in such, a, in such a way that you actually specify your key space as well as your column family. We will actually do all the mapping for you. A full data type mapping is provided in our knowledge base. We do support dynamic column families of families in Cassandra. And all data mappings are completely safe because the engine will actually refuse if you you know, give it incorrect mappings. That said, it doesn't make Cassandra a SQL data store because an insert overrides rows, updates, reads, then writes. So then you have to ask yourself, have you actually updated what you read? And then delete also does a read, then write. So you can't really be sure if you've deleted it. So why, why, would, why would anybody want to do this? Typical users include streaming data, web page hits collection, because Cassandra has this wonderful thing called a counter. The counter keeps track of things in real time. In um, MariaDB, if you do a select counts star on your users table, it actually does a full table scan. It's not very efficient. So typically forums or anything live never actually gives you the live number. It gives you some number that was cached from 15 minutes ago. But Cassandra gives you that benefit because it's just one query. Sensor data reads that are being served to look up. If you want to have very good insert speed, just two Cassandra nodes give you tremendous insert speed over what regular MariaDB can give you. So there's plenty of opportunities here. And we've seen companies like Uyala, which video, and they do use it for video analytics, take, take into using this. We ship another engine called Connect. The target for Connect is not OLTP operations. 
It is really there for business intelligence, analytics, batch operations. You can import data via XML. So if you want to record your running data, maybe from your Fitbit, you can actually import it directly into a MariaDB database. It imports access data for people who are still forced to use something like Microsoft Access. But the really cool thing about Connect is that it imports via an ODBC data source. So you can connect to Postgres, Oracle Server, SQL Server, as long as you install the Linux ODBC package that comes also standard with pretty much all Linux distributions. And you can connect to a remote ODBC data source. This gives you great possibilities to pull out data from Oracle, send the data to Cassandra, or just save the data inside ExtraDB. Again, where conditions are pushed down to the ODBC source, so the where conditions aren't actually run here in the engine. The one limitation, obviously, is that these virtual tables cannot be indexed locally, which is why, again, it's not for OLTP. So if you're reading from the file system, the file system accesses the index, the OS. If you're reading from another database, you, make, you should have already indexed it on the other database. But this is great for moving data in as well as out. You need to turn off something called engine condition pushdown, obviously, to make the where clauses actually go remotely. That's something that doesn't exist, by the way, inside of the MySQL world either. Actually, another interesting thing about the Connect engine is it's actually written in France. It's written by a guy called Olivier Bertrand. He worked in IBM all his life, and when he retired, he decided to make a storage engine that could import from multiple data sources. I've only listed like four up there, but he supports like 30 data sources, including things like uh, Windows Mac addresses. It's actually a pretty cool um, storage engine written by one guy who is now in his 80s, actually. And he's actively developing it. The Spider storage engine allows you to do sharding. It's built on top of part partitions. Typically, a lot of people want some kind of sharding when they have very large data sets. So a website like Flickr typically keeps, say, n hundred users on one shard. Spider will allow you to do that without creating your own sharding framework. It's very transparent to the user. It's, it's really easy to expand. The only caveat, in my opinion, is sharding is the easy part. Splitting the data up is easy. But when you need to rebalance the shard, like you need to now further split the data up, that, that may take a little bit of effort. Spider is running in multiple places, even here in France. The, the French Post run it. So if you like the French Postal Service, chances are it's touching some kind of spider. I don't know. I see smiles. Is, is the French Postal Service not very good? It's good, right? OK. <laughs> I, I mean, the Argentinian Postal Service, that one, you send a postcard, it comes six months later. They're not running MariaDB. We also ship uh, TalkyDB. We actually think this is very interesting, mainly because it doesn't make use of fractal tree indexes. It doesn't make use of B tree indexes. It makes use of something called fractal tree indexes, technology that came out of MIT in the last six or seven years. It has a full uh, um, pattern grant from MIT so that it's not encumbered by patents. Why it's interesting to us is because the insert speed is amazing. It is definitely, definitely faster than inserting inside of ExtraDB. But the one thing that we find most interesting about TalkyDB is the compression. I'm sure if you go to Shardagal, you will see many ads by Oracle saying 9x compression, 12x compression with Oracle's big exadata servers. TalkyDB can give you a lot more compression for free. Why is compression important? Mainly because today you're buying SSDs, you're buying flash, you're not buying spinning disk anymore, and storage space is limited. Real life users of TalkyDB include people like Limelight Networks for CDNs. Percona is building a cloud tool service, and they've also used, used TalkyDB because they want to store data in a compressed format, saving space. 
we, we think that there's a lot of potential with this engine. And I guess further potential is this company, Tokitech, doesn't only build TokiDB. The, their storage engine is called Tokyo KV. It, it's, TokiDB is the version for MySQL's ecosystem. They also have Tokyo MX, which is the version for the MongoDB ecosystem. So you may be seeing where I'm going with that. And what about the compatibility with uh, IODB or MySQL, for example? Right. So that's actually, we, we just go, went one slide ahead. Compatibility for TokyoDB, it's mostly compatible to InnoDB, except it doesn't support foreign keys. <laughs> Because uh, the way MySQL is architected is foreign keys are not in the server. Foreign keys are actually written on a per engine basis. So MySQL, for example, doesn't support foreign keys either. But so you can't do an alter table. But if you can re-architect your data, you can actually get away with using TokiDB real easy. So for new projects, it's got great potential. The other caveat for TokyoDB is backups. With InnoDB and ExtraDB, your backup methodology for online backups is extra backup. It's open source. You can use it easily. I'm sure many of you use extra backup, right? Or if you have a lot of money, you will pay Oracle for enterprise backup, which is the closed source version of extra backup. TokyoDB, being kind of new, still doesn't have an online snapshotting facility like extra backup. There's just been not enough user requirements. So the company actually sells you an online backup tool very much like how InnoBase used to sell you enterprise backup 10 years ago, a little longer than 10 years ago. So if you are going to use TokiDB, I suggest uh, using LVM snapshots. That's a great way to make backups. But again, it's something you need to plan ahead for. The default file system now, if I'm not mistaken, is XFS. XFS is a good file system. All database servers run XFS. Also, if you're going to use Galera, you really need to study your workload patterns. Fully synchronous replication is great, but you may, because of optimistic concurrency control and the way your application is written, you may have a lot of rollbacks, which, you, which then actually hurt performance. And Spider, as I said, is not just you know, easy to just drop in. Again, you need to know what, what to index. When you want to do a reshard, you, you need to know that too. So that's, again, that's all the stuff that the developers will find handy. Now we're just going to focus on the ops people. Thread pool. When you have many active threads, it's really bad for performance. Because the more threads you have, you have more context switching. CPU caches have bad locality, and you have a lot of contention for hot locks. The model for MySQL and MariaDB is to open up one thread per connection. We were the first people to have a thread pool in a production release since MariaDB 5.1. It was lib event based. We then rewrote it because Oracle released a thread pool in 5.5, so we rewrote it to use native thread pooling libraries. So now we use ePoll on Linux. <coughs> Then we decided to make it a little different from Oracle's one. Instead of a plugin, we built it into the server. And we also don't minimize concurrent transactions. Oracle's one actually minimizes concurrent transactions. So if you have, say, a thread pool size of, say, 100 threads in the pool, if you exceed it, Oracle's one will actually start limiting the transactions that can use the thread pool. We will just build a queue around it so you can constantly reuse those threads. You have to enable the thread pool, so turn it on. It's only enabled by default on Windows. And the other people that ported it was Percona. They ported our thread pool into XDB server, and then they improved it by adding something called thread pool max threads, which we then backported. So again, I think having multiple things in the ecosystem is really handy because we just push development further of the MySQL ecosystem. Basically, if you have a web app, if you have one of those messenger apps, Kakaotalk, Line, thread pools are a godsend for you. Now, anybody here who's used Postgres before probably realizes they already had authentication against Unix. Now, we also provide it. 
With Pamela's authentication, we also give you automatic access to LDAP. You can also authenticate it against SSH passphrases and so forth. You can set password expiration outside in PAM. And then we, you know, we don't stop just there. In 10.1, we'll improve it. We'll allow you to, to validate passwords inside the server. We'll allow you to set password expirations inside the server so you don't have to use PAM so you, in case you don't want to set it up. Again, I'm not going to configure, uh, I'm not going to tell you how to configure PAM, but there's one link down there that allows you to use two factor authentication with our PAM plugin. I think that's kind of handy. So when you log into MySQL now, you, you have username and password. You can have username, password, and a six digit challenge code, which you can you know, use with Google Authenticator or Authy, which is available for you for free. Extra security, probably always a good thing. We also have a non-blocking client library in where you can start operations in a thread, keep on having uh, more, more operations in that thread, the operation gets processed and the result travels back in the same thread. A uh, good reason for why you do this is you have many, many MySQL servers running and you want to have asynchronous operation of, of uh, queries. So again, show status on many machines, for example. Uh, a great paper for this. April 2014, just Google it. How Facebook queries MySQL asynchronously. We wrote this initially for Facebook, who allowed us to then open source it, obviously. And because we changed the client library, it means you can also run this against regular MySQL servers. And then uh, as a trade-off, the Node.js community, who also works uh, in an asynchronous fashion, decided that they would also write a Maria SQL driver, which is much faster than the regular um, MySQL driver for Node.js. Uh, anybody write in Node.js? No, okay. We made another optimization. Again, for people who are doing very much live schema changes, you can now have something called rows examined and a number. What, what this optimization does is it counts the number of reads, inserts, things that are modified during a query execution. And then it will take into account even use of temporary tables. And once it's reached the limit, or it realizes it's approaching the limit when the counter is exceeding the value, the query is terminated as soon as possible. Not immediately, but as soon as possible. And then it'll tell you that the results may be incomplete. So instead of doing a full table scan, when you do select star from T1, T2, limit 10, now it'll also just limit, one, limit the expression to 1,000 rows in this case. It actually improves performance. And again, this was something that Facebook had wanted because they deploy several times a day and they want to test queries before they actually do a full push. So the rows examined is a great option for you to do that. Now, good applications typically never will send you error could not connect to database or error database connection not available. Or worse, it'll spit out the entire SQL. That good applications generally don't do that. If you, but one thing that many people probably forget to do is they don't log the errors that are sent to the client. And maybe it's because it's hard to do that. So we decided to write a SQL error logging plugin for you. You can e enable it and you can log it to a file. In fact, later versions allow you to also log it to syslog. So you can then realize um, if people couldn't access your server yesterday at 10 o'clock at night, today morning when you come back to work at 9, you can take a look-see and realize why. This technically should work with MySQL 2. It's just a plugin using the audit framework. We then obviously extended it, and the version that comes with CentOS also comes with the audit plugin that allows you to log server activity, who connects to the server, what queries are run, what tables are touched, again, into a rotating log file or to syslogd. This is what banks like, typically. This is what many enterprises tend to like. This is what Oracle manages to sell you in enterprise as well. Keep in mind it works for everything except connections that are served by the query cache. So 
because there are no tables open when the connection is served by the query cache. So my advice is if you want to have full audit capabilities, disable the query cache. Though in reality, nobody uses the query cache anymore. You probably have memcached in front of it. So the, the best size for the query cache really is zero. We then really focus on replication. We allow you to selectively skip replication events, either on the master or on the slave. Maybe you don't want, uh, maybe you don't want any updates going to a slave. You can do that. So you just have a, a slave that just takes in a lot of uh, inserts. We believe in giving you more power, so we allowed you to control all replication dynamically. Why is dynamically good? You don't have to restart your server. Why is, restart, why is restarting your server bad? Because the cache has become cold after that. And sometimes to warm up that cache can take 10 minutes. Sometimes it can take two hours. If you use row-based replication, which was introduced in MySQL 5.1 onwards, and you suddenly miss seeing the statements because you're trying to debug why replication went wrong, we can allow you to annotate the binary log with SQL statements. It's turned off by default, but if you ever want to turn it on, you can do that. Now, um, MySQL replication, easy to set up, easy to fail silently. So people typically monitor MySQL replication, otherwise they become very unhappy when it fails because they actually usually don't know. So now we allow you to do checksums on binary log events. So all slaves will perform a checksum on what has been sent by the master. If the checksums mismatch, replication stops. This feature only came out inside of MariaDB, in MySQL 5.6. MariaDB 5.5 that ships comes with it. All our slaves are now crash safe, so all the data is stored inside InnoDB. Then we also included a global transaction ID. We thought that was pretty important. But we thought it was important in a way that you could actually deploy it. The MySQL 5.6 way of deploying global transaction ID suggests that you have to restart your entire topology of masters and slaves at the same time to generate a global transaction ID. Now in production, restarting all your servers at the same time means you actually have real downtime. And obviously, that's not very well engineered. We chose to change the replication packet by appending a GTID but actually more likely prepending a GTID to each and every replication packet. So you don't have to turn on GTID or turn it off. It's turned on by default for you. Why is GTID good? You want to have multi-master replication that doesn't break. GTID is good for that. You want to have easy slave changeover when the master fails. GTID is pretty good for that. So yeah, GTID works in MySQL 562, but the implementation is not quite the same. We were the first people to create group comment in the binary log. What this allows you to do is turn on sync bin log equals one and interview flash log at transaction comment equals one. Pe previously people turned it off because they'd realized that um, every time you had a commit, you would have to call fsync and every fsync call was pretty expensive. So your performance is very flat. We gave you group commit so that every time you have say anything like three parallel running queries, and, and greater. We don't call fsync every query, we call fsync as one. This also made its way into MySQL 5.6 eventually. Then we thought we had to improve it further in MariaDB 10. So as I said, we're really pushing the envelope on each other. Another cool feature, start transaction with consistent snapshot. And then you can do a MySQL dump in a single transaction to get a full non-blocking backup. Why is this useful? You want to provision new slaves. It works by getting the bin log position. Easy to provision. You want to provision a new Galera cluster node. Also easy to provision. Percona also likes this feature, mainly from the Galera cluster standpoint. So they ported it to Percona server as well. So you can get it Percona server 5.6. Then we also introduced parallel replication and multi-threaded slaves. A common problem is having one SQL thread running on the slave. So your slaves typically lag. In MariaDB 10, we expect your slave should stop lagging as long as the master and the slave are running MariaDB 10 because it turns out that now threads don't run in one, in, in one thread, they run in multiple threads. And our parallel replication 
is on a per table basis. The prior application that MySQL 5.6 introduced is on a per database basis. So again, we're more finer grained and this should be again better for you. And then we introduced multi-source application. We didn't write this feature, this came out of Taobao. This one allows you to do real-time analytics. For example, you wanna get, gather stats for your games in real time. We know FunPlus Games uses this uh, for amongst all their EC2 um, MariaDB servers. You wanna provision new shards. Tumblr used this for in the JetPants solution. They use this in, in production alongside Percona server and MariaDB. You want to do full backups of all your masters. Again, multi-source application works really well for this purpose. There's not much to say about it because every other mature database supports this feature. MySQL just hasn't done it yet. MySQL 5.7 has a labs release. They want you to try it. Again, we believe we've inspired innovation there, so that's pretty good. Something that's probably good if you have a multi-tenant environment you're running a hosting company. We allow you to kill all queries by username. So web hosting companies should love this. We allow you to kill via query ID. Query ID is not exposed inside of standard MySQL. We expose query IDs instead of just a thread ID. We allow you to kill either hard or soft. Hard means that all, all queries get killed instantly. Soft means only queries that uh, not going to actually cause corruption will be killed. We allow you to kill via connection. So every time you run kill on that username, the connection of that user is killed and then they have to reconnect to the server or just kill the query but keep the connection alive. We give you a lot of options for kill basically. So admins generally like this. We expose statistics via um, the user stats tables. User stats are stored inside our information schema and they store metadata basically. Now performance schema is something that MySQL is investing heavily in. Performance schema is a storage engine that exposes the information back at you as well. But having performance schema turned on, I don't know if you've heard of web scale SQL. Has anybody heard of that? Okay. The WebScale SQL team found that there was a 5 to 7% performance degradation when performance schema was on and not running. So we thought that was pretty bad. So we give you everything via user stats, where there is actually no performance degradation because information schema tables have been standard in MySQL for a long time. And we turned off performance schema by default. So if you want it, when you start up, you put performance underscore schema equals one or put it in your my.cnf. So we give you, um, it's, it's much lighter weight, and now we give you memory usage. Performance schema in 5.7 will give you CPU usage. We will also do that in like 10.1. So everything that performance schema gives you, we want to give you inside of um, information schema. We extended explain, so if you find that your queries are running slowly, and you want to know what happens with a running query now, you can do something like show explain for thread ID, and you'll actually get to see the current explain of the running query. Typically, a lot of people turn on the slow query log, but wouldn't it be nice to also know the explain, right, of what the optimizer was doing and why a query was slow? We allow that by giving you explain output in the slow query log. Again, something you can turn on. And then like MySQL 5.6, explains don't only work for selects, they work for inserts, updates, and deletes. And if you're not an optimizer developer, and that's not what I focus on in MariaDB either, you want to know what explain is telling you inside of MySQL or MariaDB without hiring a consultant? Copy and paste your explain output to that website and it'll actually decipher explain to you in a human readable form. This one, I don't have much to talk about beyond the fact that it's a SQL standard. It works like roles in any other fully uh, SQL compliant database. It was written by a Google Summer of Code student as well and it allows you to group and grant features to groups of people. So inside of uh, Unix, you, this is like groups, basically. Anybody here buy Fusion I.O. cards? Nope, okay. Okay, some people do. If you happen to buy Fusion I.O. cards and you, in, and you start using NVMFS from Fusion I.O., 
you automatically disable the InnoDB double write buffer, saving writes, so your performance increases. Instead of writing twice, it writes once. And then in, lately, we introduced something called page level compression as well. So this typically extends the life of your Fusion I.O. card by about 2x. And we didn't actually do any uh, much of this work. Fusion I.O. spent a lot of time doing all this work. And we ourselves don't buy Fusion I.O. cards. They, they gave it to us. It's really expensive. We have a whole bunch of other features, which we obviously don't have much time to talk about. We can give you things like progress reports when you do an alter table. So you, if you want to know if you should go get a cup of coffee or go back for the weekend for an alter, we will tell you that. We include um, engines like OQ Graph that allow you to have graphing structures inside of uh, SQL. So you, don't, you may not have to use something like Neo4j. Handler socket, so you can skip the SQL layer and go direct writes into uh, InnoDB for create, read, update, delete ops, and a lot more. All that shipping in your standard CentOS 7 MariaDB, basically. Feedback plugin is turned off by default. You can turn it on. For us, what, 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 for the 1% of the 1% of users of MariaDB, so really small, small number, it tells us if people are using a feature and it kind of gives us an idea if we should deprecate a feature or not. So one of the features that are deprecated in MySQL is show profile, which allows you to see each and every file that is touched when a query is running. So that it's good for debugging to see where to actually improve um, the server. Turn, turns out that MySQL thought this is not very important anymore, but we still see users using it, so we're keeping it on. We give you connectors. These are not shipped in standard CentOS. What's the benefit of our connectors? They're LGPL client libraries. That means you can embed for free. You don't have to worry about the floss exception that comes with the regular connectors from dev.mysql.com. So in embeddable languages, C, Java, ODBC, save, saves you money. Now, the MariaDB side on the left is not intentionally smaller. It really is because we have more optimizer features compared to MySQL 5.6. You can double check this by doing select at at optimizer underscore switch. One of the major claims to fame, and this is a huge benefit in MariaDB 5.5 that you have that MySQL 5.5 doesn't have, is that we can materialize subqueries. So previously, you had to rewrite them all as joins. But now, subqueries materialize completely inside of MariaDB. So infinitely faster even than previous releases of MariaDB. We ship Galera cluster for either in the 5.5 or 10.0 branch. And this is really cool stuff. I'm, I'll be here at lunch. You can talk about it more even. Good for today's cloud-based environments. It's fully sync replication, not async replication. So it writes to all nodes or no nodes. It's um, highly recommended to run backend services like authentication and so forth. We have a bunch of people running it. We've even had one person we know of that migrated off Oracle Rack to Galera Cluster. So not impossible. And that was actually a European company called Greets. I think it's a, it's a Dutch-based company that does greeting cards, maybe. Um, MariaDB is trusted by many. Google, Wikipedia, spam experts. I think the one that you may recognize the most is Paybox services, right? If you go into a taxi, chances are one third of them probably have Paybox services and they accept your American Express with that. And um, for what it's worth, they run MariaDB with TalkyDB in the back. So every time you swipe your card and it's Paybox services, you're touching MariaDB. <laughs> Quality for us really matters. We don't do blind merging. We, don't, we, we, use, we ourselves use system-provided SSL libraries, so we were not affected by Heartbleed. Um, if you download from MySQL Enterprise, they, they, they actually use OpenSSL, so they actually had to release a Heartbleed bug fix for the Enterprise version. And the community binaries ship with Yazl. So we were actually never affected by something like Heartbleed. But a, about a year and a half ago, we were affected by this one bug where if you ran a MySQL password for the root user up to 300 times, you would actually be able to get root login. So we actually fixed it in less than 48 hours after informing all the Linux distributions 
and then releasing. Now, Oracle doesn't release fixes every, uh, every so often. They release releases in something known as critical patch updates, CPUs, and they come out once every three months. So if you are playing around with MariaDB 10, which is not inside CentOS 7, you will note, I, I've already mentioned that the GTID is implemented differently. There is something called explain format equals JSON. We didn't like the implementation, so we're going to rewrite. We're rewriting it for 10.1. And something else called the MySQL bin log streaming server. So 5.5 is 100% compatible with all the additional features I talked about. 10.0 is about 98% compatible to 5.6. 10.1 will be 100% compatible to 5.6 and include some of the 5.7 features. We can't wait for Oracle to release every two to three years. We have to release every nine months to one year. So we have much more rapid release cycles so that you get to use features much quicker. Going forward, and 10.1, we expect the GA by February of next year. Like I said, the beta is coming out in October. You can already download an alpha. If you ever wanted column level and block level encryption, two solutions, one via a German company, Epri, and the solution I like the most is the one that's coming out via Google because they're running in production now and they've open sourced the code. So we're going to integrate that to give you column level and block level encryption for both InnoDB and ARIA. Why is Google doing this? They take uh, data privacy very seriously after Edward Snowden. So they're even encrypting connections between database servers across their own data centers. So we're benefiting from Edward Snowden. I personally responsible for the Kerberos authentication plugin. You may or may not use Kerberos. Financial services people really like this. We'll do statement-based query timeout so each and every statement can have a query timeout time. We just completed Google Summer of Code last Friday. We had four students this year, so we have four interesting new projects. And as I said, we'll be fully 5.6 compatible and include 5.7 features. And whatever duplicated functionality that Oracle has to do, they don't like to use our syntax for some absurd reason. They create their own. We will also have both syntax support, so your applications will never break. Our aim is to always make sure we're drop-in. We give you full open source documentation. Check it out. The documentation at dev.mysql.com is uh, copyright Oracle. Ours is fully open. Creative Commons and GNU GFDL, so copy it, print it, do whatever you want to do with it. We become modern. We decided to ditch Launchpad, because we think Canonical is also ditching Launchpad, maybe. <laughs> so we moved to GitHub. Um, MariaDB 10.1 is fully developed on GitHub. Eventually, we'll move all the, branch the older branches to GitHub as well. If you want to have user discussions, MariaDiscuss is a great mailing list. If you're interested in developing MariaDB, the developers list is more popular than the internals mailing list. Because we're a distributed team, my usual time zone is actually UTC plus 8. I'm usually not there, but that is my usual time zone. So you're guaranteed that there's always someone at hash Maria on Freenode. We regularly do full-on support on IRC, like any other open source project. Probably that's not what SkySQL likes, because they'd like you to buy support, but we don't mind. We're the developers. <clears throat> there's also a Facebook page, Twitter, etc. One, one slide I didn't put in there is, you know, who supports MariaDB? And MariaDB is supported by everybody that does MySQL support. That's Percona, that's SkySQL, that's every independent provider, open query. And I think, you know, up to about last month, even Oracle now, if you buy Oracle Enterprise Linux. So we are well supported by everybody, generally speaking. So I, I'm told I have probably like less than one minute left. Do you have any questions for me? Yes. Mm -hmm. And being not huge, but big enough that like stopping it, dumping it from uh, S S6 to S7 yep. uh, would take uh, longer than what your downtime uh, would be a lot for your customers. Right. Uh, in the past, I, I would do like streaming replication from one old version to another new version. Uh, is this anywhere to be aware of? So that's exactly the recommendation for our migration that we would recommend you as well. You just attach a slave, a MariaDB slave. It will actually read from, and as long as the slave is you know, up to date and can have the capacity 
of the master, you can then do a switch over and make that the master, and that's a, that's a perfectly viable migration option. And to start a slave, would you like, just uh, copy <laughs> the file of the shutdown slave and it would like, do its stuff? Okay, so there, 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 are two, there are two ways to enable a slave. One, one, you can actually attach replication and then just let it replicate. But that's a lot of network traffic. Two is to do a dump. You can do a dump. And then you can do a dump, do a restore, and then, and then do replication. It's up to you. Yes. Yes, it actually doesn't have much recovery, so to speak. <laughs> the it means that if you install a clean slate. Ah, okay. If you install a clean. Yes, yes, of course. So I'd highly recommend you to do a MySQL dump. Yes. And the the recommended method is actually here. I put that in the slides that could be useful for you. Is, is this start transaction with consistent snapshot and then do a MySQL dump. This is a great way to provision new slaves. Yeah, or, or you can use extra, extra backup. You can of course use extra backup. We, extra backup is our recommended choice as well. Extra backup or this, up to you. And we can happily read off Galera also can use extra backup methods, MySQL dump methods. So depending on how you want it, IST is obviously preferred over SST. So maybe you can dump first and then do an IST. So it, it really depends on uh, what you want. But yeah, typically the best way to do it would be to actually attach a, a slave. Or if you already have a slave, upgrade the slave. Okay. Yes, in, you can do an in C2 upgrade. It uses the same files. And if it's the same version, like MySQL 5.5 to, to MariaDB 5.5, you don't even need to run MySQL upgrade technically. All right, so that ends my question, question time. I will be at the back. Um, thank you for listening <laughs> and ask questions.